welcome to Culture Street. Thanks for having me. Um, your first book, Child 44, was a massive hit, big bestseller, won lots of awards, long listed for the Man Booker, quite something for a new writer. Aspiring writers would dream to have what you had. Um, did that, was that uh, problematic for you when you went to write your second novel? Um, it didn't feel problematic at the time. I, I was, you know, I wrote Child 44 with out any contract, um, living off my savings, worrying about how to pay the rent, that kind of stuff. And just thinking, I'd wake up every morning thinking, is this even going to be published? And you have to overcome that, that sense of uncertainty. And it wasn't an obvious book in terms of its um, commercial proposition. I had no idea whether it would find a home. Um, and so that, those were a series, huge series of challenges. And then so suddenly have a publishing house that was excited about you and you know, an editor to speak to was you know, a lovely experience. It was a nice, um, and so there were many advantages you get. I think you suddenly, are, um, you suddenly start seeing yourself in a slightly different way. And it's quite important that you actually try and hold on to that sense of actually you're still just this writer in a, study and you need to sort of push out everything else and just concentrate on the thing you really care about. Um, so there are some challenges, but I think if you asked any aspiring writer whether they'd, which one they prefer, I think they'd, they'd prefer the challenges of, of being published yeah. to, to not being published. So you didn't feel the pressure to do as well with your second book? It's a, it's a swap of pressures. Oh, you definitely feel that pressure, mm -hmm. but it's a swap of pressure. So you lose the pressure of, oh, you know, is it even going to be published? And, you know, am I wasting my time and should I, you know, go and do another job? I mean, that's the thought you think of many times. You think, should I do something completely different? Am I kidding myself? There's that pressure to, I need to somehow maintain this level. I need to, which is, I think if you don't let it bog you down, can be a positive pressure because you should want to maintain a level. And Your background is in, previous to Child 44, was in script writing for TV. So why, why did you move into novel writing? What inspired you, particularly with this novel, just to begin? I mean, careers are just a series of, I mean, uh, well, early careers particularly are a series of accidents, I think. I mean, if you look back at what I was writing at school, the thing I loved to write, I loved um, short stories, I loved plays. That's all I put on, I kept writing plays. So at school, put on plays when I was 14, 15, 16, you know, all the way through, and then at university, I put on loads of plays. Um, and I was writing prose all the time, but I'd never really written TV. So um, it was just that when I came out of university and I was looking for a job, I really wanted a job that was connected to writing. And the first job that I saw was a job on a, a long-running TV show, and the adverts had no experience necessary. I didn't know anyone in the TV industry. I had no connections. So I just turned up to a, a story conference and had to sort of you know, say ideas around a table, and they uh, they hired me. I was very lucky. I mean, I, I don't know how many TV jobs say no experience necessary on the advert, and uh, that was the first job. And so I got in through I got in through TV. Right. And what was what was the reason for this novel? What inspired the, um, well, particularly the setting? Because initially you used a real life serial killer who was um, around in the 80s. Yet your setting is in the 50s. So, so why, why 50s in Russia? Um, I mean, I got a job in Cambodia working on Cambodia's first ever soap opera and I was there for nine months. And um, before I went out there, I was very nervous about whether you could tell stories about a different society. I was very sort of apprehensive about it. And when I arrived there, I realized actually there are some fundamental stories that you can tell wherever you are in the world, love stories, um, stories of revenge, there's a kind of universality to them. And you just have to push them through slightly different societal prisms. Um, and then I came back from Cambodia and I was in London. I got hired to adapt a screenplay by Jeff Noon, who's a science fiction writer. And it was a premise was that you could make criminals safe by downloading or removing the criminality from their mind and then just releasing them back into society. And so I started exploring this notion of what criminality is. So I started reading lots of true crime. And I came across the case of Andrei Chikatilo, who murdered in the 80s in, in Soviet Russia. And he got away with perhaps 70, they're not quite sure how many people he murdered, but perhaps 70, perhaps more um, victims. 
And he got away with it not because he was a criminal genius, but because the state denied that he could even exist. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I thought this is a really interesting premise. And I was looking at it at the real case, and it was spread over such a long period of time. I found the police investigation frustrated me. Uh, some of the prejudices frustrated me. So I thought the only way to really, for me to tell this story was to fictionalize it. And then I thought if I'm going to fictionalize it, where's the best place to locate it? And since this was a, a story about the society rather than the serial killer, and the, the society as in the state as this main threat, the most extreme period of that was the 50s, which under Stalin. And so the real serial killer in, in Child 44 is, is the state rather than the actual the killer. And so that was the sort of logic and that was the way it got moved back. Right. There's an incredible scene in the book, I think it's in the first half of the book, where um, Stalin has died and everybody moves together and converges in their grief, despite the fact that they've suffered terribly. Um, did you do a lot of research for that in that? Because it's a very moving part of the book. Yeah, I mean, that is, that is true. There was an enormous um, groundswell of grief. And it's interesting, you can see it in dictatorships like North Korea recently. And I was looking at the photographs in North Korea of the crowds weeping. And it's hard to know what's really going on. I think some of it's real. Some of it's people are indoctrinated, so they feel like they must fear, there's a lot of fear. Fear. And it's hard to pull apart. You know, if you look at one of those photos, it's really interesting. You can go along the line of faces and try and work out who's really crying, who's sort of deluded in crying, who's self delu like deliberately forced themselves to believe this sort of propaganda as a way of survival, who doesn't believe a word of it but knows that they have to cry. And you, you know, you can go along the, the, the line of faces and try and figure it out. But what you can't do is stay at home and refuse to engage with it. That's very dangerous. Um, so on some level, you have to come out to that, to that sort of funeral session. On some level, you have to then produce a response. It's very hard to disengage from it. I mean, that, that's a sort of direct danger to your life. I mean, the, uh, it's very, there are moments in the book which are very dark. I mean, terrible things happen. And one of the, one of the things that comes in and out of the book is the torture that, that goes on. But it's not, it's not terribly graphic in the way you describe it. And there's a particular means of torture that you use a number of times in the book. There must have been other more graphic um, ways that torture was handled. Why did you decide to almost subdue it a little bit in the, in the book? Because it's about the psychology of the torture rather than the actual instruments itself. I think the problem with that is at some level it, that becomes about anatomy and it becomes, it's almost, it almost engages with a deep, it depersonalizes it on some level. And I really wanted to concentrate on the question of truth and this question of this strange paradox of torturing someone from the truth and when they give it to you, not believing it and actually torturing someone to get a lie the lie you want to hear, that was what they were doing. It was um, kind of extraordinary. And that, to me, was the really interesting aspect of it, and the really disturbing aspect, actually, rather than the sort of the physical pain that they were inflicting. I was, I was much more interested in trying to uh, capture what psychologically they were asking, asking for. And then that resonates across the whole book, if it was just a series of, of uh, I don't know, tortures that were just sort of physical they don't really have any resonance beyond that room. Whereas this one is a, is, is a question that is asked across the whole book, which is, are you prepared to stand up to power, yes or no? Uh, and what is this truth? This truth actually in these totalitarian regimes is, is very flexible. They try and mold it to whatever they want. And so truth itself becomes in flux. Uh, and that's what it is in those, in those torture sessions. Yeah. So that was the interest for me, um, rather than the torture itself. With, with the, uh, the background that you have in screenwriting for TV particularly, uh, were you interested in adapting the book um, for film? You know, I was, I was 26, 27 when the book rights were sold. I've been working on it for two, two years, two and a half years, and it just felt like I wasn't the right person at that time to do it. And they hired an amazing writer, Richard Price, who's written some amazing novels like Clockers and Lush Life. 
and you know he's Oscar nominated for his screenplay The Color of Money. You know they found gr a great team of people to do it. So there was never a sense of I need to do it to protect it. Um, and you know I, I, I saw the movie in the, the summer of last year, and, and they've done a wonderful job with it. So I was always in very safe hands. I was always, you know, the book was always in a great sort of a body of people cast. Mm -hmm. Were you consulted along there? Yeah, they, you know, they send you emails yeah. and they ask you, but it's it's a very, it's a, it's not. I'm not a producer. I'm not. It wasn't a collaboration as such. They're just very. They were they were very lovely, basically. I mean, they they took me to set twice. They filmed in Prague, and it was really fun. You know, you get to meet everyone, and mm -hmm. it's very exciting to see them filming and. Um, it was just a really, really nice experience. So you've seen the film? I have. You enjoyed it? Yeah, it's, it's really, really great. And, you know, it's a thriller, it's beautifully shot. Um, and are you happy that it stayed true to the book? You know, they always have to make changes, obviously, but the changes they've made I understand. And the truth is that central relationship is very powerful in the, in the, in the movie, and it's very emotional. Mm. And I got to the end of the movie and felt actually the emotions I'd felt when I was writing it. Your most recent novel, The Farm, has a very dramatic opening, which is based on a real life experience that you had. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, four years ago, I was writing Agent Six, which is the final book in the Trial 44 trilogy. And I was living in London, and my parents had retired to a farm in Sweden. And the idea was that they were they were tired of working, they had, they had had some tough times, but they sold their house in London and they thought, we're going to have a wonderful retirement in the, in the countryside of, of Sweden. My mum's Swedish, my dad's English, so it was a sense of going back home. Mm -hmm. And they seemed to be very happy out there. I got a call out of the blue from my dad, and he was crying, and my dad very rarely cries. I might have heard him three times in my life mm -hmm. cry, and he's crying, and he says to me, my mum, is uh, in hospital, she's been institutionalized, and she suffered a psychosis, and I need to fly out as soon as possible to see her. And I had no idea anything was wrong. Um, how long have they been, how long have they been in Sweden for? They had been in Sweden for a couple of years. Right. And then they come back and forth to England, but they've been in Sweden for a couple of years, and I visited them. This is very different to the actual story yeah. they told, but no, I'd visited them, and it seemed wonderful. I mean, it was a beautiful farm, and it seemed like they had got everything they wanted. And I then booked a flight to Sweden. And it was late in the evening, I think. Anyway, I can't remember, but it was, I, I couldn't go straight away. It was the next day. It was the earliest flight. Before I could take that flight, I get a call from my mum. She's left the hospital. She um, told me that she was sane that my dad was lying, in fact everything he told me was a lie, and that he had been involved in something terrible, a criminal conspiracy, a conspiracy of some kind, and she was coming to England to tell me the truth about what happened. And she says, listen, I've left the hospital, I've convinced the doctors, he's lying, I'm telling the truth. And I had to rip up my flight ticket to Sweden and wait for her at Heathrow. And she arrived, and I took her back to my apartment and listened to her, her version of events. And I had to decide whether she was ill or my dad was uh, involved in something awful and had done something terrible. And that was the sort of, that's the sort of fundamental premise of the book, which is a, a son or a child having to decide between their parents. And Daniel is the, is the son yeah. in the book. Um, and it goes, back, so he's one of the narrators and the mother's one of the narrators as well. Um, did you... I mean, it's obviously a very personal story, even though you fictionalised what had happened to you. Did you need to speak to your parents about writing this story? Yeah, I mean, they read actually all the drafts. So it's the first time in my life that my mum has given me notes on my book. So I got notes from my editor, notes from my mum. Um, they did. I mean, I, I, there, were, there were many options with this book. And the only option that interested me was telling it with my mum by my side. I mean, you could have thought, oh, let's wait until much later in my life. And I was like, that doesn't, uh, uh, I, w I wouldn't want to tell it then. It feels like then you're doing something almost behind their back. So it was very much like we're either all involved or it can't be published. That was, you know, that was the, the way I saw it. And so then they got involved not only with reading it, but with um, talking about it in the press. So we did an article together for the Saturday Times. Um, which was a photo of myself, my mum and my dad. 
And they were reading the article and I was like, I wonder what they're going to say about the article. And my dad was just like, I look terrible in this photograph. Um, they've, you know, they've, they've embraced it in that sense. And I think it's about, my mum now gives lectures in London to women about making a recovery. Um, this is all very different to the book. But yeah, no, I think it's trying to take something that is sad in our lives and rather than brush it under the carpet, turn something positive out of it. I think that's the do energy. You, do you of the think book. the process for your mother of being involved with the book helped her? I can't speak for my mother in that sense. I certainly think there is a sense of closure that might not have happened if we'd all just pretended it had never happened. I mean, I, when I was in Perth at the Literature Festival there last week, I got a call from my editor. And my editor came, phone rang me with the news that the book had gone to number one in the UK chart. And the first person I rang was my mum. And it was funny, when I told them about the story, i.e. The, the premise of the story, they were like, oh, who's going to be interested in this premise? Because it was, you know, they had gone through it. I think there was this fundamental modesty that somehow their lives wouldn't be of interest to anyone else. Mm -hmm. And I think when I phoned her a week ago and said, you know, it's number one, she was just really happy. It was like we felt like we had put a line under on some way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, that was, it's trying to take a, a sad event and turn it upside down. Mm -hmm. And, and the, other, the other narrator, Daniel, um, has a secret that he's hiding as well uh, from his parents. How important was, was that? How important was it that he was keeping something to himself? In the first draft, it wasn't important at all. In the first draft, it was all about the mother's voice. I was figuring out her story, how she spoke, what that story was, because all of that, all those characters are fictional, everything that happened in the book, all of those people are, aren't real. So it was developing that, and I guess I thought she was the fundamental energy of the story. It then struck me when I in the sort of rewriting that the person listening to the story was very important. We needed to understand what was going on in their mind. Because when you tell a story face to face with someone, the person you're telling it to is, becomes a part of the storytelling. Their reactions are important, their interruptions are important. And so suddenly I realized actually it's really key that that be a character in, in their own right. And the truth is, I didn't want the question of unreliability to simply be about sanity, is someone sane or not. We're all unreliable narrators. Uh, we all make mistakes and our perceptions are sometimes two steps to the right of what is actually going on. That's what's interesting. And so it's interesting to have someone who has, is full of secrets but is apparently sane with someone who is apparently or possibly insane also full of secrets, because then you ask, well, actually, the difference becomes much smaller than you think it is. Mm -hmm. And so he has to accept, because she is saying, you think you know your father, you don't know your father. Well, he has secrets from her, and he has to accept that if it's true for him, it could be true for his dad. Mm -hmm. And so then suddenly that was the, that was the sort of thinking behind it. And this, this whole, um, you did it a bit with Child 44, even though it wasn't a, um, sort of based on an event that had happened to you. But using a true event to then fictionalise something, do you think that, in a way, is, offers more of a protection for an author rather than writing a straight memoir? Um, a memoir, yeah, I, I, you know, they're very, they are very different. I mean, this... Well, particularly for the farm. The it's farm. Based on a, it is based on a... Well, I mean, turning the farm into... Had I just written a piece of um, non-fiction for that, uh, the truth is, the story my mum told me that night was a kind of shorthand. I knew everyone on that farm. It didn't really add up in the same way. It didn't really have a direction. It was a series of fragments, a series of vignettes, really. And what I was really trying to do is um, capture some of the ideas of that night. And in order, to, in order to do that for a reader, I had to create a fiction. And so in a weird way, I used fiction to try and get closer to the, the true feelings. I think if I'd used the truth, I don't know what the reader would have felt, but it wouldn't have been the feelings I had felt that night. Um, so yeah, it was a, a facilitator in that sense. I don't think the story could have been told as a piece of non-fiction. Well, congratulations on it being number one in Thank the UK. You. And uh, what's next for you now? Um, I'm adapting the farm actually for screen, so it's oh, interesting right, that yeah, so yeah, it's you are going on to uh, yeah, no, this one, I, yeah, I thought, I, I, yeah, I'm doing that, uh, which is exciting. In fact, I'm doing that. I've done a draft. I'm doing a new draft on tour, so it's happening as as 
you know, as it all unfolds. So maybe Australia will be folded into it somehow. Um, uh, so I'm doing that. And then um, I have a TV series coming out on BBC Two in the autumn, uh, a thriller. And oh, I. Does it have a name? Or are you yeah, called London Spy. London Spy. Yeah, with Ben Whishaw, um, Jim Broadbent, and Charlotte Rampling. Oh, brilliant cast. Yeah, amazing cast. Mm. Uh, and what else? And then a new book at some point, which I'm not sure what that is yet. Okay, well, we look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you.